Okay, I think we're gonna, th first of all, thank you friends for sh turning up at this last talk of this se series, uh, which is fine with me. It's gonna be interesting to see if we can make it through the 33 slides in 25 si minutes. Let's find out. Um, if you're interested in, um, oh, I should say this, this when, when we signed me up for this talk, I actually worked for a company called Nearform. I worked for them for almost four years. And um, I stopped working for them last June, but by then everybody thought that I was doing this doc for near firm, so I left the branding in. Okay, so we are the people who brought you open sources art, near form. We really believe that, and we really think that it, uh, you know, in a really short, hey Mike, in a really short bit of time tells you everything you want to know about how we feel. Um, I get around this, the world of speeches, and uh, one of the things that happened to me a few years ago was I met this guy, <laughs> and if you know who this guy is, then you're laughing, but this is a picture of Jacob and I on our first conversation about whether open source could help him. So some of this presentation is a story about one guy who managed to string stuff together uh, and create a bit of a revolution in his own backyard, but also a little bit about how that could happen more broadly. But first, I want to tell you a little bit about the history of open source as a vector for change in municipal governments. Um, this is Extremadura. That's the first place that we all heard about um, because they were gifted a fantastic system for provisioning um, educational systems to, in a very, very poor place. And um, Dave Neary is going to remember seeing Extremadura everywhere back about 20 years ago because they were the poster child for change at a municipal level through open source. They were very poor. They could not afford, especially in the, in the light of the um, dot-com bust, any spend on computerizing their schools, and yet they had promised they would do it. They got a grant from some Scandinavian countries, and together they built a really nice client server system that's still in use every day in Spain now, 20 years later. So that's a pretty good story, right? Um, another big story in this in the early days was Munich. Munich famously kicked Microsoft out. Unfortunately, at the time that they did this, that meant they had to have their own Linux distro. <laughs> And that's a big chunk for a city. <laughs> um, so they struggled with it. Eventually, they went back to Microsoft because the administration changed. More recently, they've gone back again to free software, um, this time you know, services serviced by SaaS. And it uh, looks like it'll stick this time. But this was a really high profile thing in its day. We all spent time giving them advice from our lofty perches in government, I'm sorry, in uh, tech industry OSPOs. Um, this is the French Foreign Ministry of Finance, which runs to this day on uh, now uh, LibreOffice Calc. So they, they have influenced um, the development of Calc in the direction of being able to use it instead of Excel, which is impressive. Um, France has some interesting laws about public code needing to be um, publicly available and that have been adopted by a few other European countries now. So um, they've got a lot of open source code, which we'll talk about again in a minute. There are, there are large organizations, well-funded organizations, famous organizations that have been working on this problem space for a while now. Um, this is a brigade meeting in um, San Francisco, uh, and the brigade system was set up by um, Code for America. So Code for America's original idea was, was um, Tim O'Reilly's wife came up with this idea that we could do open source um, in a bespoke way for specific municipalities, but because it would be open sourced eventually, it would eventually build up a whole network of open source solutions that could be used again. Unfortunately, she had a really hard time getting the municipalities to allow open source to be part of the equation there. And um, so they've, they've pivoted their focus, but um, they learned a lot of lessons. One of the big lessons they learned is the stuff you learned in tech companies is not going to translate well to municipal governments, and as we've learned, also not so well to academic institutions. I mean, some of it is universal, opens what open source is, right? But how to implement it for the good or, uh, or the policy good um, for outcomes that a municipal government would care about or a mayor would care about, that's a little bit harder for us to know about. Um, there are some organizations that have been trying to learn about this. Bloomberg has spent a lot of money in France 
on generally making things better through technology, but they're not exactly understanding how open source works most of the time, most of the people that help. Um, we've had good um, luck with Sloan lately. They're starting to get really smart about this, and they're listening to us, so that's a thing. Um, and us is the people who have spent the last four years really pushing hard to try to get this to happen. Um, Jason Hibbets here is my hero in this regard because he has been on the front lines forever now. He got his own town, the city of Raleigh, to um, make a bigger bet in open source. It was slightly easier because Red Hat is headquartered there and they were the open source darling and some of it was funded by them. But he has done a lot of work on his own time, not his day job, making sure that this would all work. And he wrote a great book that's worth seeing uh, if you are interested in this space. Um, when I wrote this presentation, which was right before FOSTEM in 2020, San Francisco had just decided that they were going to change their voting to an open source system, which made uh, Brian Bellendorf and I, who both lived in San Francisco, go, oh, no, because we don't think that's necessarily a good idea. And Brian runs Hyperledger Foundation, so if anybody would think it was going to be a good idea, it would be him. Um, but at least they're making some inroads finally. Brian and I started talking to them about this literally 22 years ago. So, you know, <laughs> change takes time in municipalities. All right, so this is the real story I want to tell you. And you maybe hear, have been hearing scraps of it all week. Um, this is Baltimore, Maryland, last year, okay? Baltimore is going through a very hard time. I gather that The Wire is actually a docudrama. Um, there's lots and lots of mistrust of the authorities by the populace, which is mostly people of color, and they're just, they're, they aren't having it. And, but also, um, the city fathers, uh, current city fathers, kind of screwed up and allowed a ransomware attack to basically shut down all of their compute systems for a good six months last year. So you couldn't send an email to the city, <laughs> which is problematic, right? Um, so... This is indicative of a larger problem all over the Rust Belt in America. But this, the Rust Belt in America is not the only place that has this problem. And, I'm, and I did say global change. So whatever area of the world you're interested in, you know, think about it, in, frame it in this way. Places that have not gotten sufficient maintenance over the years, where things have been allowed to kind of rust away, um, those are the places that we think could really use a boost from open source. And we think that open source program offices at the municipal and, and academic level are a way to create you know, centers of excellence. And it, if you make it somebody's job, then the football is going to move a little bit down the field every single day, whether or not you know, they get it all the way down. At least it, somebody's paying attention to it, right? Um, what has happened so far in Baltimore, thanks to some people in this room, are um, the city, as I said, is sort of not very functional right now. But there are some major institutions in Baltimore. Of course, it's adjacent to Washington, D.C., so that's a thing. But um, there are some institutions in Baltimore who are kind of picking up the slack because there is a generation of children that are going to fall through the cracks if we, we sit around and wait for the city to get their act together. So these people run neighborhood centers. St. Francis Neighborhood Center is the one that um, we know the most about, we've worked with most closely. They're great. It's like a, a boys' club on steroids, basically, but it's a private, nonprofit institution. They um, offer, you know, sp extra classes, breakfasts, um, homework after school stuff, meals for kids and for elders, cross education about technology. But they had a need, which was they couldn't figure out how to serve their population effectively because they had no way to schedule them, no no tool to schedule them, and. Um, Jacob, who I showed you a picture of earlier, actually lives not too far from St. Francis and wanted to help them. And so he went looking for a solution and he found me. You guys already saw that picture. But he also went to Paris, and why wouldn't you, right? Now, why, why did he go to Paris? What's there? Well, there's Lutece. You guys heard about this already today and, or this week, anybody? Well, then I'll go ahead and say Lutece is an amazing piece of software that was developed by the city of Paris. They paid some people to write it, but to their specification. It's 217 separate open source services. I mean, all the code is open that they stand up. And if you want to interface with the city of Paris as a citizen, you go through Lutece. 
You go through Lutest to get a marriage license. You go through Lutest to um, report a pothole in your street. You, you, you know, go th if you want to actually go meet the mayor or something and you, <laughs> you need to make an appointment, that's how you get one. Everything that happens, happens through Lutest. And it has been open source for over 12 years because of the rule that France has about public money going to public code. However, they were not getting traction as an open source project. And this is problematic to their young female mayor who at, caused one additional service to be built as she was coming in, which was uh, participatory budgeting. They actually put up a, a sizable chunk of change, like $5 million, is that right? Is it more than that? There you go, 100 million euros every year for the government, I, I mean, sorry, for the populace to comment on, like, how should this money be spent? And they have a process for winnowing through all the crazy you know, asks to some that could actually be actionable and be done. And then they report back that they're doing them and people can see that they, they had influence. And this ties people to government. This makes people realize that they are the government at the end of the day. If you can't convince the French of that, you know, I don't know if you have any hope to do it anywhere else, but it seems to be working. So much so that just recently they've been very, very interested in going deeper. So um, this is an example of the Greater Paris area, and this is um, the projects of the year that I snapshotted. This is how they report back how the money was spent. Um, this is the CIO of the city of Paris, Neja. Neja is our ally in trying to bring this work to Paris, but truthfully, we wanted to help them. This is one of those give and get things. Jacob met them. They wanted to learn how to make a real open source program. We wanted software for St. Francis. <laughs> and guess what? They have a scheduler in the many services that are available through um, Lutes. So we made a marriage. We got their permission to talk to their engineers, to um, get some help for some engineers that were hired. Sorry, that's Jacob. You guys know him. By this guy who's sitting over there. So this guy is Saeed Chowdhury. He spoke here yesterday, and he was work, day before yesterday. Sorry, he was uh, it, he's in charge of the library. But one of the things that Jacob did was convince him to open an open source program office at Johns Hopkins University, right? Because that creates a center of excellence and a focal point for all this kind of work. So out of nothing and a lot of traveling and goodwill that was produced by meeting people, because he's tireless at that. He got a major city <laughs> to agree to collaborate with a major research institution, Johns Hopkins University, for the benefit of the populace of a city that is falling over. If that's not OSPO's networking for global change, I don't know what is, right? And, and, it's, and it's actually working. So I think it's pretty amazing, and I think that we might have to stop for a minute and have a little round of applause for these guys who worked this out, because this was not an e a for sure thing. I mean, Jacob's been working tirelessly for mostly no salary for about four years on this. So, um, Meanwhile, there he is. Um, he pitches. He explains it to people. Um, municipalities are interested, so interested, in fact, that we talk to them all the time. We talked to some of them yesterday here about, about Cascadia. And um, everywhere we go, we try to find people to talk to about their local situation because that's what it takes. You've got to find people who have a fire in their belly in the local community, a, a tangible project that can be fixed. Right now, we've got this great tool of Lutes. We've got the desire of the French government to, or sorry, the Paris government, to increase the use of Lutes. And by the way, very limited use even inside of France. Lyon is the only other city that has used it very much at all. So they really didn't know how to build community. Now, when I talk about the things that are different about this to the way that we talk about OSPOs in tech, and I didn't say this at the top, but I actually started the first OSPO when I was at Sun Microsystems, and I mean the first office that was called that, right? <laughs> I'm not saying I invented the, the concept, but it was a very early open source program office. And then we used it to create change. We open office, that project came out of that office because the company wanted to hurt a competitor to disrupt a market, but I, because I was in the Peace Corps as a kid, wanted to try to make the digital divide a little bit smaller. 
Nobody in the senior management of Sun cared about that at all. They just wanted to stick it to the people that have an office here. But um, I knew that it was possible to do good while doing well. You know, if you, if you can align human need with corporate greed, you can get really far. <laughs> so that was a pattern that I wanted to see more people pick up. There were several people that went through my OSPO that went on to do amazing things in other OSPOs, like Chris DeBona worked for me before he worked for Google, came up with Summer of Code. So a great program, right? Um, the idea that your OSPO can't only be about compliance if you're a tech company is not something we can say yet to the municipal governments because they don't really even have programming resources most of the time. That's why the connection between academia and municipal government is so important. And um, because then at least you can get some programming resources brought to bear on behalf of the municipal government's need, right? Now, I, to remind you, Baltimore hasn't woken up yet and even said thank you, but they will inevitably. Um, these are some kids using Lutas at St. Francis. <laughs> and I love this picture because it's girls and they're girls of color and they have that because of this work that these guys did. So, um, all right. Uh, and this is a lab at Johns Hopkins. What's in it for Johns Hopkins? You guys all know that open source runs on enlightened self-interest, right? There has to be a hook for you or, there's, or you're not going to be able to pull it off. There has to be a hook for your university or your institution or they're also not going to be able to pull it off. Well, it turns out that Johns Hopkins is very interested in increasing its reputation as a place of innovation as a place of, um, you know, they, I mean, they actually get more research dollars than any other American institution, but they haven't done a good job of turning that into headlines that tell you how cool Johns Hopkins is in the same way that, say, MIT has done. So they were looking for a, a lever, an edge, and when I say they, I'm now talking about the provost and the deans and the people who said yes to Saeed and Jacob when they said, can we do this thing here, right? Um, all right, so a little bit more about how it's different to address an academic or municipal government than it is to talk to a tech company. And the reason I'm harping on this is because you always know you're doing good work when everybody is Im imitating you, right? <laughs> and just now, there's all of a sudden a lot of people interested in being experts about how to do an OSPO. There's some really good work that's been done in the tech sector for the tech sector about how that works. It's not as perfectly applicable to these other fields of endeavor as they would like to think it is. And that's, they'll figure it out. Um, there's another institution that started in Europe, a sort of by Europe for Europe OSPO advice kind of thing. We told them at the time that it was going to be a rough road. And they are now discovering that indeed the funding flows in a different way. And if you saw Saeed's um, talk recently, he was talking about how weird it is that you do the work and then the money comes in this because it's a bleeding edge thing. Now, hopefully, we'll be able to educate a couple of the grantors so that it comes on the, uh, in the other way because it's way easier to hire people if you know the money is going to come, right? But it's a beginning. They did, in fact, get you know, remuneration for the work that they were doing. And not from Paris. It came eventually from one of the funders to Johns Hopkins. So um, that's one of the things that's different. But also, they don't have the same resources at their disposal. They don't even understand a lot of the time. Part of the reason that they're having such a hard time gaining good access to technology as municipal governments is they don't really know how to disambiguate between good and bad, right? And there's a couple of, of enormous American companies, global multinational, but American companies that are selling the old-fashioned proprietary suite of products and that, that work um, locks them in in a way that is really old fashioned. So they get this crazy bundle of stuff. It looks like a really good deal because it's dirt cheap. They get into it and they realize that the complexity of the number of things they said yes to is too much. So they try to back off thinking like anybody would, well, if I, if I back off, it'll get cheaper. No, the contract says that if you take anything out of the bundle, you start paying full price for everything. So they're just stuck. Right, and it's terrible. Um, so helping them through that, helping them figure out how they're gonna use open source in a time when they don't have resources, they maybe already made a bad decision and have blown the budget and something that's not really helping them. Um, they don't speak French, so they're a little worried about this Parisian thing we keep telling them about. Um, this is a lot of work, 
right? That's why we're trying to create a network because academic institutions have really good reasons for learning open source, right? They've got a provision, especially if they have CS departments, they have to start teaching it. They have to because everybody that's hiring wants that skill now. They, everybody's looking for collaborative development. Um, in my other day job, I also run something called Intersource Commons, which um, Salona was there when we started that. Uh, it is designed to teach people how to use open source methods inside proprietary companies. The reason that I spent the last seven years setting that organization up for success is because I believe that is the only way that we're ever going to get enough maintainers. I don't think we can buy enough. I'm pretty sure we can't educate them fast enough. But there, something like 85% of the engineers in the world are still stuck in the salt mines. And if we can teach them how to work collaboratively, some percentage of them, probably only 10%, will fall in love with it and start looking for opportunities. That's happened over and over again in already in open source. So that's what the whole inner source play is about. It also coincidentally cleans up some really crufty old engineering practices, so yay that. Um, anyway, this is a different thing than what tech OSPOs know, by and large. We're still learning it ourselves. It's not like we'd have you know, we, we've run into a few of the problems, but we have by no means exhausted the problem space. But um, we're hopeful that people will join us in trying to figure out where all of these um, landmines lie. Um, this is a slide that's supposed to remind me to talk to you about Cascadia, but I kind of already did. We had a meeting with them yesterday talking about the Cascadia Innovation Zone, which I gather hasn't done a whole lot other than create a conduit between um, British Columbian institutions and, and places in Washington state, but of course they want to extend it down into Oregon as well. Um, it looks like there's some opportunities there and we're going to keep working with them because what we're all about now is finding little nodes of the network that we can help because we can learn more things from that. Um, the other big news which you've heard here before probably in this week is that the European Commission is getting ready. Are you, do you need something? Oh no, you're doing her. Um, European Commission is, has just announced that they have, they're setting up an OSPO at the federal level and they're going to fund 20 OSPOs at the member state level in 10 in academia and 10 in um, municipal government. We're super excited about that, especially since we helped them to this idea. <laughs> so yay that, and we think it's going to do some interesting stuff. But part of the reason we're seeing this scurrying of people from the woodwork who want to teach this is that there's money involved now. And um, boy. I, I, wish we, I wish there was a way to decide who, you know, sort of right-thinking consultants are going to be. Um, this is a slide to remind me to talk to you about Ireland. This is the city of Limerick. There is a guy who managed the city of Limerick exclusively with open source software, kicking out decades of Microsoft for the last five years. Um, he's actually Romanian, but he's a naturalized Irish citizen. And he just got a plum job in Dublin to try to get them to understand what he did in Limerick. Limerick, for those of you who don't know, is kind of the equivalent of Oakland, or, or not, not quite Baltimore, but it, they used to call it Stab City. So they're trying to, you know, regenerate. And it's a beautiful place. That um, castle was actually built by the same King John that, you know, was after Robin Hood. So there you go. Um, all right, so OSPO plus plus, yay that. Um, the plus, the first plus is to include everything, including data and hardware. The second plus is it must be a network. And we heard uh, yesterday that To Do Group is now also going to be a network, so that's apparently an idea that's sticking. So you're in this audience, and you're, you're riled up now about OSPOs. Um, what can you do? Well, you can learn about OSPO plus plus. And I'm going to give you a URL in a second here. You can attend a meeting on October 7th for the OSPO++ community. That's going to be very interesting. And that way you get on our mailing list and you can keep coming to things. Um, you can evangelize the OSPO++ network in cities and universities. Send them to us. We're happy to talk to them. You can, if you d work in this field and you see a pattern that works, by all means, tell somebody. It doesn't have to be us, but we are starting in the same way that we did with Intersource Commons uh, to collect patterns to give people ideas of where to start and then keep doing it because it's going to take a while. It took 20 years for open source to win in the marketplace. This is going to take longer than that. So we got to all decide that we care and really, you know, roll up our sleeves and get there. All right. Um, this is the logo for OSPO++ and we have a few lapel pins if anybody's wild to wear one. And I am going to take questions for 30 seconds. Anybody got a question?
Wow, was it that complete? <laughs> Are you just tired because you've been in this room for three days? <laughs> oh, you can totally do that. I'm easy, although I do live in Ireland, so. Um, uh, I'd like it to be less. I, I, I pulled out every trick in the book to get uh, Intersource Commons to happen faster. So, 